and wants to get a nose job. Just that kind of person. And I shot him right here. I gave him his nose job. He wanted... This is Shayna Hubers. Call Ryan standing over me and grabbing the gun that was sitting on the table and pointing it at me and saying, I could just kill you right now and get away with it. Nobody would even know. Ryan Carter Poston was a successful lawyer from Fort Mitchell, Kentucky. He was tragically shot and killed by his on and off girlfriend, Shayna Michelle Hubers, on October 12th, 2012. Poston was born in 1982 to Jay Poston and Lisa Carter and had three younger sisters. After completing high school, Poston attended Indiana University, where he pursued a triple major in history, geography, and political science. He then obtained his law degree from Northern Kentucky University and began practicing law in Cincinnati, Ohio. Poston and Hubers, who was a psychology student at the University of Kentucky, first connected on Facebook in 2011. Despite the long-distance nature of their relationship, they started dating. They had a turbulent on-and-off relationship for 18 months. Poston was supposed to have a date with Audrey Bolt, Miss Ohio USA 2012, but was murdered on the night of the date. Plans on the night of October 12, 2012? Yes. Who were those plans with? With Ryan. I was held up at a family event prior, and then we agreed to meet a little bit later in the evening. Did you go to meet Ryan? He didn't show up. Did you wait? Yeah. Did Ryan ever show? No. And did you ever hear from Ryan again? No. Hubers claimed she killed him in self-defense at his condominium in Highland Heights. Hubers had shot Poston six times, but insisted that she acted in self-defense each time. He would pick on me and, and belittle me and bully me in front of strangers. And it could be for something as small as how I was eating my food. After her arrest, Hubers was held in the Campbell County Jail as she was unable to pay her bail. Her trial started on April 13th, 2015, after she pleaded not guilty to the murder charges. The prosecution argued that the murder was committed to permanently sever the couple's relationship. Defense lawyers argued that Hubers was a victim of domestic abuse and that the shooting was done in self-defense. During the trial, the prosecution presented text message evidence showing Huber's preoccupation with Poston. They called several witnesses, including Huber's former cellmate, Bolt, and members of Poston's family. Huber's friend, Cicely Miller, also testified that Huber's boasted about killing Poston and joked about giving him the nose job he always desired. Couldn't stand to watch him twitch and knew he was gonna die or have a completely deformed face. He's very vain and wants to get a nose job. Just that kind of person. And I shot him right here. I gave him his nose job. He wanted. On August 14th, 2015, Hubers was sentenced to 40 years in Kentucky Department of Prisons with a 34 year parole eligibility period. However, when it was discovered that one of the jurors in Huber's murder trial had previously been convicted of a crime, her conviction was reversed on appeal on August 25th, 2016. Hubers was found guilty of murder again during her second trial on August 28th, 2018. She was given a life sentence with a 20-year parole eligibility period on October 18th, 2018. Another terrible case of boyfriend killing is that of Jody Arias. This is Jody Ann Arias. Ladies and gentlemen, I have received your note indicating that you are unable to come to a unanimous decision. Travis Victor Alexander was a successful American salesperson loved by his family, friends, and colleagues. However, his life was tragically cut short on June 4, 2008, when he was brutally murdered in his own Mesa, Arizona home by his ex-girlfriend, Jody Ann Arias. The news of his murder sent shockwaves through the community and beyond. The details of Alexander's murder were gruesome. He had sustained 27 knife wounds and was shot in the head. The police found defensive wounds on his wrists and his jugular vein, common carotid artery, and trachea were cut. The evidence pointed to a premeditated murder, and the prosecution believed that Arias was responsible. 
The investigation into Alexander's murder revealed shocking details about his relationship with Arius. The police found deleted pictures of the couple in provocative sexual positions, taken just a few hours before the murder. They convicted Arius of the first-degree murder of her ex-boyfriend Travis Alexander. They also found DNA evidence from Arius and Alexander in a bloody palm print on the bathroom hallway wall. Arius initially denied any involvement in Alexander's murder and even claimed that she had not been in Mesa on the day of the crime. She alleged that Alexander had been abusive towards her and she feared for her life. During the trial, Arius claimed she killed Alexander in self-defense. But with her record of lies, who would believe her? To this day, I can hardly believe I was capable of such violence. And here now, I can't in good conscience ask you to sentence me to death because of them. Meaningless, especially since nobody believes what I'm saying anyway. You said it right there, no one believes a word out of your mouth. Why do you keep talking? Because I know that I'm not just, I've lied before, that doesn't mean that I'm a liar by definition, by character. To a lot of people, they think this switch from I want to die to now I want to live is just another lie from Jody Arias. I don't know what that means. Was I lying when I said I want to die or was I lying when I say please spare my life, you know? Still, the jury found her guilty of first degree murder. They could not agree on the death penalty during the sentencing phase, and Arius was given a life sentence without the possibility of parole. The trial received widespread media attention, and many wondered how such a heinous crime could happen. Yet, there's an even more popular case that raised issues about ethical and moral obligations to other people, and that is the case of Michelle Carter. This is Michelle Carter. What I am doing is... I'm looking at myself so negatively. Henry Roy III was just 18 years old when he took his own life on July 13, 2014. His girlfriend, Michelle Carter, 17, had been urging him to commit suicide through text messages. The case, known as the Texting Suicide Case, was the focus of a significant investigation and involuntary manslaughter prosecution in Massachusetts. Night is the night. It's now or never. You better not be me and saying you're going to do this, then purposely get caught. The texts, emails, and phone calls between the couple in the days leading up to Henry's death were recorded and analyzed in court. Judge Lawrence Moniz, who presided over the trial, ruled that Carter was guilty of involuntary manslaughter as she had repeatedly urged Roy to commit suicide, even though he had a history of mental illness and had been prescribed psychiatric medication. What I am doing is... I'm looking at myself so negatively. Conrad had gone through a number of issues. His parents divorced. There was allegedly some domestic violence in their relationship. His grades were really struggling in school. He had a history of depression and anxiety. In fact, he had been hospitalized previously for a suicide attempt. Looking at myself, a minuscule little particle. On the face of this earth It's no good. Trash will never be successful, never have a life, never have kids, never, never learn. But I have a lot to offer someone. Henry and Michelle met in 2012 while visiting family in Florida. Although they lived just 35 miles apart, they communicated mainly through text and email. Henry had a troubled family life, experiencing physical violence from his father and verbal abuse from his grandfather, which may have contributed to his mental health issues. He even attempted suicide after his parents' divorce in 2012. Michelle had urged him to seek professional help on several occasions. However, her messages took a dark turn in July 2014, when she began to encourage Henry to take his own life. Despite seeing several therapists and counselors, Henry's social anxiety and depression worsened. He even overdosed on acetaminophen at 17, leading him to seek help from a cognitive behavioral therapist before his death. On the day of his suicide, Henry recorded videos of himself speaking to a camera before taking his own life with carbon monoxide fumes in his pickup truck. Hi, this is Conrad Henry Roy III, reporting to you about what's going on through my mind going on through my head the last few days. What I am doing is I'm looking at myself so negatively. Henry's funeral was held at St. Anthony's Church in Mattapoisett. In his honor, 
the Northeast Maritime Institute established the Captain Conrad H. Roy III Scholarship Fund. Michelle Carter was charged with involuntary manslaughter in February 2015, seven months after Henry's death. She was found guilty at trial and was originally sentenced to two and a half years in prison. Nevertheless, her sentence was eventually reduced to 15 months, of which she served 11. This court, having reviewed the evidence and applied the law thereto, now finds you guilty on the indictment charging you with the involuntary manslaughter of the person Conrad Roy III. Carter's case was unique and raised so many questions, but so did the case of Ezra McCandless. This is Ezra McCandless. Please rise. Ezra J. McCandless was a woman born in 1997 as Monica Kay to a teenage mother, Rosalina Gunnelson, in Stanley, Wisconsin. She remained close to her after her parents' divorce when she was 12 years old. She experimented with different names and pronouns in high school before legally changing her name to Ezra McCandless. She moved to Eau Claire, Wisconsin after dropping out of college. In August 2017, McCandless moved in with her boyfriend, Jason Mengel, a 33-year-old National Guard medic. Around the same time, she met Alex Woodworth, a 23-year-old barista and substitute teacher at a coffee shop. Not long after, McCandless had an abortion and started a secret romantic relationship with Woodworth. In February 2018, McCandless accused one of Mengel's friends of sexually assaulting her while she passed out. Woodworth did not support McCandless's account of events, and the case was later dropped. After Mengel found out about McCandless's relationship with Woodworth and the alleged assailant, a public argument occurred at a coffee shop. McCandless blamed Woodworth for ending her relationship with Mengel and asked him not to talk to her again. She continued to talk with Mengel and sent him journals expressing her regret for betraying him. On March 22, 2018, McCandless saw Mengel at a coffee shop and then went to visit Woodworth at his house. Later that day, McCandless knocked on the door of a dairy farmer, Don Sippel, claiming she was a victim of an assault. She was covered in blood and mud and had some bruises. This is Don Sippel calling and I have a, a young lady that just came to my house and somebody attacked her and she needs a doctor. Her, her clothes are all torn and... And what is the address you're located at? When detectives searched the dairy farm, they found Woodworth's body. He had been stabbed 16 times in the head, neck, groin, and torso. McCandless was arrested and later convicted of his murder. She initially claimed she could not remember what had happened. However, the evidence presented during her trial suggested that she had planned the murder and attempted to make it look like self-defense. She was sentenced to life imprisonment and showed no remorse or reaction as her sentence was read. McCandless's obsession led her to ruining her life, just as the hot-tempered actions of Camilla Gamet did. This is Camilla Gamet. Camilla Gamet's life changed forever after being found guilty of first-degree murder. Her lawyer argued that she killed an unknown attacker in self-defense, but the jury didn't buy it. Marcel Hill, her 38-year-old boyfriend, was found dead on May 18th after suffering multiple stab wounds and a beating. During the trial, Gamet testified that she hit an unknown attacker with a lamp and stabbed him with a knife. However, the evidence presented in court painted a different picture, leading to her conviction for first-degree murder. In 2013, Camille Gamet, age 31, and Marcel Hill, age 38, were living together in Jackson, Mid They were a odd couple because they had very different and opposite personalities. Marcel was described as friendly and childlike. He worked at a fast food joint and only had a high school education. He suffered from some disabilities. After the verdict was announced, Hill's family held hands outside the courtroom and prayed. Hill's aunt, Diana Banks Joyner, expressed her gratitude for the jury's decision, stating that justice was served in getting a violent person off the streets. Banks Joyner also mentioned that the family seeks closure in this case, and that there is still much to be learned. Gamet's lawyer, Anthony Raduazzo, expects to appeal the outcome. However, the prosecution pointed to the number of weapons found and the manner of Hill's injuries as factors that influenced the jury's decision. You were relentless. You stabbed, you stabbed, you stabbed, you stabbed, you stabbed until he was dead. 
You didn't think he was an intruder. You know, maybe one stab wound. Okay, maybe maybe that's seven defense. But you 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 put in eleven more to make sure he was good and dead. So I hope I, I agree with the family. I hope you die in prison as well. You know, and if this was a death penalty state, you'd be getting the chair. Gamut was sentenced to life imprisonment without the option of parole.